Yeah, hello everybody. Um, so this panel here is about alternative data, um, still a very hot topic in the investment industry. And uh, we're joined by some of the luminaries in the industry. Um, to my left here is Evan Reich. Evan is the head of data strategy and sourcing at uh, Verition Fund Management. Um, he is, prior to Verition, he was head of data strategy at Quantal, um, which is the alternative data arm of NASDAQ. Before that, he was at Blue Mountain Capital, worked at Millennium Partners and SEC Capital. Uh, then we have Eli. Eli is the head of data management at DRW. Uh, prior to joining DRW, he was the head of data at Wells Fargo Asset Management, head of data architecture at Tudor. And uh, during his uh, career, he uh, was involved in various problem domains, including options analytics, distributed storage, and even combat aircraft simulators. Uh, he holds a BS computer science degree from Technion and masters from NYU. Uh, then we have Alexander Donov. He is the co-founder of Turnleaf Analytics. He actually is the co-author of the book of alternative data. And uh, he has a master's from Oxford. Yes. And uh, then we have Francesco Carrera. Carrera. Uh, he's at Graysoft, a multi-billion dollar VC fund. Uh, before that, he worked at Bellatron, uh, and got a PhD in economics and uh, wrote several uh, papers and books on machine learning. And I am the moderator, Gene Exter. I've uh, worked in alternative data for uh, 15 years now. I teach the subject at NYU. Uh, I also work in data analytics uh, at Maiden Century. And prior to that, I was at companies uh, involved in alternative data like Majestic Research and SEC Capital. So let's just jump right into it. Um, so let's start with an easy question for the panel. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, just one quick thing for compliance reason. Everything that I say is, is my own opinion, my own words. <laughs> yes. Can I plus one this? <laughs> Everything I say is actually their opinion, but it'll be fine. Okay, so let's, um, let's start off with a really easy question. Evaluating alternative data. It's a catch-22 for funds. Uh, if you're an institutional investor and your job is to evaluate the potential alpha of an alternative data set, how do you avoid the catch-22 where the costs of evaluating the data set is sometimes so prohibitive um, that it seems like it's impossible to even approach the topic of alternative data? How do you... Um, how do you make it easier? How do you solve the problem of uh, evaluating vendors uh, of aggregated and raw alternative data in the investment context? Evan, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that the easiest answer to that is that really that calculus has changed a lot over the years, that if I think about, you know, years ago, you needed to go to the trouble of loading everything yourself, putting it in, you know, structure yourself, analyzing it yourself, doing data science on it yourself. And we've seen that there's a lot of firms that have come along to really simplify that process, either with their own data or working with other people's data and making that accessibility simpler. Just because of the amount of cloud technology that everybody's using now, that's made a lot of the process simpler. So I think those costs have come down a lot. So if you want to just dip your toe in the water and say, I want to check out, you know, one thing and do it that way, you can pick a vendor that makes it easily or more easily accessible than another. By the same token, to get you know at a lot of the more interesting things, certainly earlier in the cycle, you do need to do a lot of the work. You do need to incur those costs, but that's where you have to have more of a commitment to it. So you have to say like, look, these costs do get spread out over doing the work on 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 data sets. And so at the point you're willing to make that commitment and you can see a firm is making those commitments by hiring data science people, by hiring data strategy people, by hiring data engineers to do that kind of work, then you can start breaking it down so it's not so expensive on a per data set basis. But I think you have to make that choice and, and go into that intelligently rather than just saying like, oh, I want the latest and the greatest and the most complex thing. Yeah, if you do that one time and need to hire a team to build it, then that's going to be a very expensive proposition. 
And for just just like shipping in and but like the 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 general feeling is that as you are correctly saying the cost of experimentation is going down drastically, which means that you can do much more with less less people, less data, less data points, less less complexity and everything. And also like the relationship with vendors is changing a lot. So like a lot of these people will make you like try the things before you buy. It's like the type of engagement that you get is much more longer term. And once you build specific models and things out of it, it's very hard to change some of this stuff. So eventually, like, you know, finding that alpha and proving that a specific data has some value, it starts with some hypotheses, it starts with some modeling and experiments. Um, but it's not something that you just, you know, came out with one morning and like you do everything in one day and everything is like, you know, perfectly working. It takes time. And usually the time you, you have like different way to amortize that time and like running different experiments with different providers, different data, different data points. And honestly, there's like a bunch of like open source things out there already. Um, even like when it comes to data, there are like a few things that you can simply use to test. Yeah, uh, if I may add something. Yeah, the biggest cost was the cost of data, especially for very niche data. Uh, now we see a trend of that going down. And to the point, Francesco, uh, uh, also free trials are available. Um, I'm a data vendor. We purchase a lot of data. We sell macroeconomic forecasts based on alternative data, but we give client access for at least two months of, of, uh, of data. And we need to guide them often. So the publication of white papers and research, which proves that there is really a signal for different task classes, be it equity fixing, is important. And this further facilitates the process because you know, selling data, it's, you know, it's, it's like an exploring a jungle, unless you have some signposts, uh, some concrete trading strategies, elaborate on that data to guide the researchers inside funds. Uh, you know, this can, can become more costly, but most of the data vendors now, they tend to disclose uh, the signals they have. Uh, so it makes life easier compared to what was a few years ago. Well, let's dig into that a little bit. I mean, um, where does the responsibility lie as the industry matures on proving out the validity and the, the value of the data sets when we're talking about the dichotomy between the vendor and the fund, right? Where does, like, where does the responsibility of the vendor stop and the work of the fund start to basically um, determine whether a new uh, raw or aggregated data set is additive to the investment process? Well, um, having been on both sides of the equation, I've been on the data vendor and on the data consumer. I have a very black and white kind of uh, point of view on that. The responsibility of uh, value is always on the data consumer, is always. Whether you find the value in the, in the data or not, it's all totally up to you. The vendor, the vendor has the responsibility to provide the most accurate, most timely, most um, clarified uh, data, but and stand behind the methodology of how the data was collected, uh, or methodology how was the data was uh, produced. Other than that, it's all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, that's. I I think there is like a slight gray nuances here, which is if you are a raw data provider, you are completely right. Is there is like a UI or an interface or a dashboard that like the final customer can leverage. You still need to do like a small extra step to make sure like the data is accessible in a in a way that the customer can use, right? Which means that you know having a nice software that people can use promptly and having like a way to filter data and blah blah blah. If you are like an API guy that just like you know stream things into a database, hundred percent with you. Right. Right. I agree with what everybody's saying. I think it's important to recognize that you have to kind of understand the data you're working with. I mean, like when I think about like what Turnleaf is doing, you've got a firm that's being run by two people that have used data a lot, that understand how to work with it, that are experts in what they're doing. And so they're processing it in a way where they're adding a lot of value in doing that. And at the same time, because they're macro signals, it's something that potentially a lot of people can use. I think what you see challenges with is when people have very granular data that maybe speaks to a very small area. If you process it too much, you run the risk of like only one person can use it and really see the value in that data. And so it's how far down that path do you want to go? How much, 
how much of the answer do you want to give away in the process? And as a result, what does that mean about how many folks you can sell it to, how you can price it, how folks can use it? You know, news data, everybody can read the news and everybody does read the news and analyze it. When you get into specific, you know, one specific interpretation of news sentiment coming from one particular vendor, that may have a much more limited audience because it's reading the news in a specific way. And so you have to say, you know, where on that continuum do you want to stop given what you're saying and what that means? But ultimately, it's a choice for the vendor to make in terms of their business model. And, and as Eli says correctly, the consumer ultimately has to decide what makes sense for them as a business. Yeah, and I also think, you know, there are many data vendors, you know, evaluate to your point, Evan, trust, you know, who is selling you the data. And we had very negative examples of, you know, firms selling synthetic data, uh, firms that did disappear, you know, without mentioning any names, you subscribe, you read the contracts, you start paying and they disappear. And, uh, you know, you have thousands of data vendors, so you have an ecosystem. So how, how to manage this and you know, how, how to make your third party due diligence process right? That, that, that's also very important. And it's continuously evolving. So we'll get it right. So speaking of the ecosystem, let's talk about the technology stack of this evolving ecosystem of alternative data. Um, obviously, we have an industry where data is in the name, right? So, you know, you're dealing with technology, but, you know, in my personal experience working in the industry, um, there has, it started off being not a very tech savvy, tech uh, oriented industry, but that has dramatically changed over time as some of the newer tools and techniques are becoming available to deal with the spe specifically unstructured data, um, such as transaction data. Um, Let's talk about some of the um, modern tools and techniques that are available to both investors and intermediaries um, when working specifically with unstructured, raw, alternative data sets. Eli, you want to um, Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the tech stack. Um, and this ties to our first question about... Um, whether the data has become more accessible today via the, the sheer amount of tools that exist. And if you've uh, heard the, the second or the third panel today with the folks from AWS and from Microsoft and from uh, IBM, uh, the, the sheer number of Lego pieces that we have today uh, allows you practically to get an access to pretty much any data set, given that you, you wanna experiment and, and try, um, the only thing that stands between you and um, accessing the data is, is understanding of the new concepts uh, in the technology world. And this is something that is uh, slightly, it actually changed radically over the past 25 years. So, so the, the entire stack has changed into let's keep the data at rest where it resides. Let's not move large volumes of data. It's expensive. Um, petabytes of data should not be moved, but rather... Uh, separate the uh, the storage and the compute concepts. Like separation of the storage and the compute is the quintessential paradigm that that changed in the last 15 years. Um, so if the data resides um, in some data center, essentially whether you call it cloud or on on prem, uh, you bring your compute with you. That that means your your computes, your CPU can connect over the network to the place where data resides. You can all of a sudden. Um, Bring your compute, work on your data, extract the value that you need, but leave that data uh, sitting there. You don't need to shuffle the petabytes of data from place A to place B. There is nothing proprietary in that data until you make it proprietary with your insights. Now, these insights are by, by design are much smaller, which you can store locally or you can, um, uh, you can then further enhance in, in, your, in your particular uh, location. In terms of tools, um, I'll, I'll use AWS terminology, but uh, I will not discriminate uh, Azure or, or Google in that respect. Um, stuff like distributed SQL engines like Athena, for example, uh, they are coming up with uh, Jupyter Notebooks today that you can, with one line of code, access the data and start working it. If you know a little bit of Python or if you know a little bit of SQL, you can start querying the data immediately, which means... Uh, you're dropping all these paper cuts. So, you know, the death by southern paper cuts. How do I do this? How do I do that? Today's provider, today's ecosystem, either when, within AWS or, you know, it's technologies like Spark. It's a distributed, uh, distributed um, data engine, right? Processing engine. 
uh, Spark with a little bit of uh, understanding of what's the object storage, like S3, gets you up and, up and running in days, not in weeks, not in months. And you can actually launch it, everything you don't really need, uh, powerful computers. It's all abstracted away from you. So that's kind of the way I see um, the ecosystem uh, working right. today. Well, what about the tools that are um, the technology that is specific to the the challenges present in alternative data, right? So um, I'm specifically talking about things like um, ticker mapping, entity mapping, uh, bias reduction, uh, the, the panel issue where users drop in and out of the panel of data. So let's talk about some of the um, new modeling techniques or existing modeling techniques that are that have been used by successful practitioners to address those issues. Yeah, I can try to take this one. Yeah, uh, there are methodological challenges uh, when it comes to working with alternative data, of course, to the point of failure, you know, big volumes, but the good thing is you don't have to move the data. Sometimes you interface with an API or you take a dump from S3 and you get the data in a time series form in your computer. So the, there is one problem here. For example, in terms of analytics, we deal with 6,000 different variables in our model. So we have around 1,000 uh, different data sources. So how to manage the multitude uh, of simple data streams? They've been simplified because we interface for an API, but how to manage the multitude? So this is a technological challenge because, uh, you know, alternative data comes from many data vendors in different forms and use more than one data source. So how to orchestrate these, these data streams? And, you know, there are several solutions. Uh, out there like Apache Airflow, and you have to follow the, you know, the data feeds almost every minute to, to understand if something uh, uh, breaks. When it comes to methodological challenges, the, even if you interface in a clean way through an API, sometimes you get data that's not of great quality, and this is not limitation of the data vendor, maybe this is a limitation of the source itself, like web data. And you have to extract data and you have to extract sentiment, which is noisy. Or you buy satellite data in their cloud, so you don't have a data point, so you have missing data. Uh, you have outliers, genuine outliers, uh, technical outliers. You have problems with stale data uh, as well, because you know you, you can source, we source a lot of data from public entities like the United Nations, uh, NASA, and so on. And they're by no means obliged to give you a data feed. You know, and they're not contractually obliged with free data, but all of a sudden it can disappear. So how to make interpolation, extrapolations, outlier removal. Quality so it comes control. With, with, yeah, a lot of techniques, you know, and, and it happened to us. All of a sudden, a, a data series is missing, or all of a sudden. And what do you do? You have immediately to have the process to find the closest replacement proxy. Uh, so for in order your models not to be interrupted uh, uh, from running. So it, it's a whole process. So it's technology engineering, it's methodology, their machine learning techniques to do the interpolation, extra extrapolation, but it's also a process. People who have to follow this, these different pieces. I think one of the key bits really speaks to a lot of the mechanical delivery pieces um, you know, just sort of the rise of the cloud is sort of help with that in the sense you used to be, you'd say, did I get the whole file? Now, if you're connecting to somebody's bucket, like presumably it's all there, they've handled that, you would think. Um, but what's been interesting, I think, with the rise of Copilot and, and, and technology along those lines has really been that a lot of the people who understand how to work with a given data set, the ones that get like, ah, here's what's happening in retail data or whatever, maybe aren't the best programmers. And so it gives them the ability to actually take their knowledge, extract what they need, translate that better without needing to explain it to somebody who's maybe technically competent, but doesn't have that same field of knowledge. And then there are the things like ticker mapping that have always sort of been true, where no one's really an expert. Like somebody just has to spend enough time to sit down and go through it and dig through a lot of stuff that no one has an expertise, particularly of like, here's all the things that make up, you know, a given ticker. You have to uncover that and discover it. But again, by virtue of Copilot and AI technologies and search engines and everything, can you take somebody who's a relatively less expensive person, give them a mandate and say, okay, you go chase this down. Great. Now do it a thousand more times. Now you've got something to be done. Now you finished. Great. Now do it every morning at 8.55 a.m. before the market's open. Um, that's kind of always been the process, but I think the, the threshold for the capability of that individual has come down so you can get people that are maybe more energized earlier in their career cycle who want to do that kind of work without needing somebody who's like, ah, oh, you have 20 years of Python programming experience because you don't need that as much now to actually 
do that work. And that's been, I think, a really big change will continue to be a big change going forward. But a lot of that stuff is still going to be, you know, human effort and, and manual work, because there's really no way to automate those things. Just I mean, you've seen this over the years, Gene, like everything that can go wrong does just every single thing. So that's just life. Yeah, yeah, I would uh, argue that majority of the building basic problems were solved today. I would argue that we are mere integrators. So let's separate a little bit the domain engineering, whereas we understand the data that we're looking at and we actually want to extract more value and further value versus the, uh, well, whether the, the data arrived or the data was, or tickers were mapped. So um, if you're going into production and you need your tickers mapped, the problem is solved. So, you know, there are vendors out there that, that will do that, you know, uh, without limitation, like, uh, there is Mactia, for example, as a company, they just do this for you if there is enough value for you not to do it yourself. Or the building block of, of uh, workflow orchestration is done. Uh, it's solved, it is a solved problem. Um, what I would argue is like, you'd need to start from the domain, from what exactly you want to do, from hypothesis, rather than, you know, and then integrate things or do the prior research for things that already exist and just integrate them. Let's talk a little bit about um, commoditization, the commodity aspect of alternative data, right? There's a lot of argument about, <clears throat> well, alternative data is becoming much more prevalent um, for um, in, in the investment community. Um, so what is, you know, is the alpha being decayed or eroded by everybody having access to the same type of data? So if we take, um, let, let, let's say, Take transaction data, for instance, right? If a fund has access to the category, the broad category of transaction data, um, does that mean that another fund um, may see less value um, when purchasing that same data or that same category of data? Why or why not? Um, is it on the category level? Is it at the vendor level? Where does where where does the balance between um, alpha preservation in alternative data and sort of degradation of the commodity value of alternative data sit? Where's that boundary? I can try to give you like a first stab at this question, uh, especially because I'm coming from a different market sector industry background. And that connects also to the previous question and I have an answer because it doesn't really apply to my industry somehow. Um, it, and what I'm going to say is going to be controversial, but not everyone has access to the same data, at least in venture. That that might be true for edge funds, it might be true for other players, but in venture that is not the case. Um, and it's not the case for a bunch of different reasons, but first of all, because I scraping things is very complex from a compliance perspective, is costly to maintain, to do the like in the first place. And historically speaking, the industry hasn't been very data driven somehow, at least like not like in the same fashion as like the edge fund industry, right? Um, which brings us to the point where a lot of people are buying data from different providers. But these data points are incredibly expensive. So you can buy some of those. You need to buy some of those as a baseline, otherwise you can't do your job. And there are different people that buy different things for different reasons. Um, part of this is related to your investment thesis. If you invest in the UK, you buy a UK data set. If you invest in enterprise, you're gonna buy something else, right? So you don't need to buy every single thing, clearly. You buy only the things that have like, the highest value to your company. And as Eli was saying before, even if we buy the same data, is as always, what you do with the data sets that matter. So like that, that data points might be the same. And by the way, there is like a small caveat here. The funny thing about our industry is that even if you do your job perfectly, so if you have the best data, the best model, the best team, every single thing on the data side of the list, it still doesn't mean that you're going to be able to win the deal or to close the deal. Because there is always that aspect where someone needs to reach out and convince the founders and trying to see if there is like a fit and everything else, which means that it doesn't matter how good you are like on the data side, clearly that helps, right? Because you can get to a deal much faster than someone else 
or you know way before than someone else or whatever it is or had more value but at the same time it doesn't guarantee success it's not like i find a stock which is under value i buy yeah uh, i would argue that you know there again there's so many data set and data source so it's unlikely that two entities will use the same combination okay so, for example, our U.S. inflation forecasting model uses 500 different variables, in, including pollution data from NASA, theater ticket sales in Broadway, a, a lot of things. So it's unlikely that, you know, two investors, we, we rely on the same data set. Even if, you know, uh, two of them use credit card data, uh, there is a lot of variation uh, within that space. Do you, uh, yeah. do you think there's a relationship between the dimensionality of the data set provided and the um uh the ability to arbitrage or the, the alpha decay of that data so it it does does do the dimensions have to do with it is the more raw the data the less likely it's going to be used in the same way yeah no, that's true it, it's dimensionality referred to complexity i imagine of the data set in, in the tab, definitely but I, I wouldn't speak only about alpha decay uh, when it comes to predicting gdp on inflation this is not going to be arbitraged away you know, inflation is going to stay. And uh, when we speak about trading strategy in, in a space like FX, this is something that we can observe and we observe with some mm, data sets that have been uh, commoditized. But I would argue, you know, it's like having a Bloomberg terminal. Would you extract a lot of alpha? Uh, most probably not because everybody has it. But if you don't have it, you don't have even beta. You don't have alpha, you don't have even beta. So you're left out of the market. So certain data sets, of course, alpha is going to disappear, most probably new sentiment, but unless you have them, you'll be left out. So you must have them. But this is my argument. No, uh, data sets are going to, to stay here, not because alpha disappears, the whole data industry behind this type of data is going to disappear. N not at all. It's going to be commoditized and value will come uh, from the volume rather than alpha. Evan? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important one as a consumer of data that every time you approach a data set, you think to yourself, like, what am I trying to get out of this? And sort of Alex alluded to this and Francesco alluded to this as well, which is, you know, sometimes you're just measuring the market. You want beta out of certain things. That's important. That's necessary. Um, sometimes you're looking for alpha. If something is alpha today, you should, you know, I, I think really the lesson to take away from it is you need to keep checking into it periodically and not just trade it blindly and say, ah, oh, the signal was strong six months or a year ago or even yesterday. But make sure that you're still applying you know, some test against it to say, has this changed? Is it relevant? What is this saying? Um, and also understand who you are in the sense that if you're you know, trading a strategy that's similar to a lot of other people, that may mean something. You can use something that's oblique when you know, in prior years I worked at funds that were you know, more credit focused and if we were doing things that you know, everyone was using, but we were applying them to a context that wasn't necessarily the context that everybody else was using them in, that could be a very unusual approach. And so you should always be cognizant of that fact, I think, as a data consumer of just saying, you know, why do I think I have a story to tell here? Um, and just not lose sight of that and make sure that, you know, I think it has less to do with any one individual data set and more about prioritizing them and saying, if you're going to, you know, look at 50 things and say, which one should you start with? You should say, what's the one here that has the most interesting combination of being data and a context that you know suggests that I may be able to get some outsized interesting result out of this? And then do them in that kind of rank ordering because if you're just doing the same thing as everybody else, you're always going to be chasing the tail. So. so speaking of different asset classes, I want to go back to what Francesco was saying about uh, how um, you know uh, the, the private equity or venture capital industry is now using alternative data. That's a fairly new phenomena, you know, if we compare it to, you know, sort of traditional, if such a thing exists, uses of alternative data, which have typically been in, you know, long, short discretionary funds, some in, you know, macro equity funds, um, you know, uh, more and more so in quant funds, even though it's, that's really difficult to do. Um, but, you know, this use case of it um, being used outside of public equity um, is, uh, you know, I think for most of us, except for you on this panel, is going to be pretty foreign. So um, as much as you can, can you go into um, how, um, you know, how VCs use alternative data, what they're looking for, you know, what they're looking for, what insights, um, you know, and if to the best of your ability compared to how um, 
public equity portfolio managers use it? Um, so you're right. It's a it's a kind of a new thing. Um, depending on like the funds that you're speaking about and the time frames that you want to look at, is definitely not like a 25 year trend. It's a, it's more something that pop up like in the last 10 years or so, um, different degrees of intensity. And the main thing to remember, which is the reason why this entire thing exists and is um, you know prospering these days, is that we don't have a Bloomberg terminal. Not because we cannot buy them, but because there is not like Bloomberg for startups, right? So you guys have somehow like that base, like that baseline of unique source of truth. So the price is the price. The balance sheet is the balance sheet. That's the thing. For startups, you know, there are data sets that are better than others, but there is not like that unique thing that you can open like every single morning and get an entire snapshot or picture of one company. So the the main reasons for these providers to exist is that they need to fill those gaps. And those gaps are not going to get filled for the first stages of the company for the first few years. So different providers find different ways and different proxies to optimize for specific gaps, which is why you buy different data sets like in the first place. Um, I can't, I, Cannot really speak for PEs because P, like PEs is a different type of business and way you're working. For venture, if you if you structure the venture process in four or five different steps, you have sourcing, screening, due diligence, trying to win investments, and post investment support. Right? Different funds do different things. The majority of the people use alternative data for sourcing and for screening. So the, the main question that everyone ask, um, ask himself is, where is the next Facebook is coming from? What do I need to invest next? Clearly, again, all these models are probabilistic models. No one tells you like, the truth 100%. You still need to make like a, you know, a call on that specific company, market, product. Um, but the majority of people, there are people that are using it to help more portfolio companies, people that use it to win a deal, people that, especially these days with GPT and LLMs, blah, 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 the, there has been investors that have been like, using it for due diligence purposes, right? Especially if you are like a smaller fund that cannot like afford an army of like 10 associates, you try to make some of those things like in a streamlined fashion with GPT. Um, but the majority of funds use it for sourcing reasons. And it's like, you know, I know this as spike in GitHub stars. Is that an interesting company or not? And I mean, like, this is me being provocative. We know that this is not good enough, but uh, these are like the type of signals that you try and like to look around for. And again, you identify the company and somehow you have ways to surface specific companies versus others. Um, but that that's like the main use case that you usually get asked to when you at least when you start this process right the moment that you understand that you build the um, the different use cases you understand like the value in data blah 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 you start doing more and more things on top of it but usually there's like you know day zero it's like okay you have like five different data sets uh under variables find me something speaking of alpha decay i wonder how many people uh, from the audience will walk away and everyone had the access to the same panel with an idea, oh, Bloomberg for startups. That's something that we should build, right? So in that respect, um, I think that the, the uniqueness of the, of the industry here uh, for Francesco is um, you have a very clear reversal of I need to start from hypothesis and dig what are the data sources that are satisfying uh, my need for information or for extraction of, of alpha uh, in this case. Uh, what are the indicators that will identify whether the startup is going to make it or break it? Uh, and that includes uh, a lot of specific alternative data. The markets are not in a good indicator. Uh, starting from social media profiles of the founders, how credible is the team, how they perform their time, what, what are their ages, what they do in the spare time, and so forth. Like competitive uh, landscape. Competitive landscape is a super interesting stuff in alternative data. Um, there are several providers that do that, but um, ESG, you know, once you dive into a certain sector like ESG, uh, there are startups today that uh, provide um, 
they collect um, carbon foot, like they can collect pollution data, which is the ground truth. And then it's an independent valuation of, well, whether the idea is going to fly or not, or whether the, um, you know, an equity is going to uh, perform well, uh, just because their ESG parameter is not great. So um, I think that's, that's kind of the, the, the it's an it's a indefinite possibility, but rather it going from what's the outcome to what's the data source that matched that uh, is important. How do you think about validating something like ESG data or data that um, has, um, it's basically very difficult to dig up the ground truth for what, for, for what the data represents, right? So, um, you know, can we talk a little bit about, you know, validation of data sets when the ground truth is, uh, difficult or impossible to find. I I think it's still proxies, right? So if you don't have like a direct relationship between the variable and the outcome, there is always like a something in between, and this is where you do like the best possible thing to proxy that specific variable, like in the best way, either like through a combination of different things or like through a single data point. But again, this like, it's, it's funny because we are circling back to the, like, to the first question that you ask us. And at the same time, it connects to what Alex and Evan were like discussing before. It's, uh, it's true that we start with questions. So we have like hypotheses, right? And we test those hypotheses in such a way that the data can tell us something. For you, maybe it's different because uh, you get larger data sets and you try to understand, okay, is that useful somehow and now? For us, there's like usually day two. So once you have five data sets, you suddenly realize that, hey, if I have product reviews and GitHub stars, maybe the two things combined makes more sense. But the reason why you bought it like in the first place is that you thought that product reviews was a good thing and GitHub was a good thing. So I'm going to use that like, you know, in a separate way, which is, again, like it's fascinating for me because I'm looking, you know, to my own job in five to 10 years here. And I, I know where to go after this panel, but. You're safe. So we have just a few minutes left and I wanted to wrap it up by asking um, each of the panelists. Um, just, you know, if, if you have a, an idea of some of the key trends that are currently affecting the alternative data industry, um, that are really the catalysts for the future where we might see things five years from now, if you had to come up with, um, one key trend, one key takeaway, um, for the industry, what would be, let's start with Evan because you've been in this industry probably the longest. I mean, I think the most interesting development really is around the ability to customize data, which really is a function of sort of AI tooling and the ability of a person to take their interpretation and through technology put their own spin on something that previously wouldn't have been easy to do. It used to be you got data from people and everybody got the same data set and that's what you got. And now the fact that you can put it through a filter that doesn't necessarily require all the technical skill. It doesn't require you to be a data scientist necessarily. It doesn't require you to be an expert, but can put your own individualized spin on something for any given investor is really, really, really powerful because it means as many investors with as many views have as many different ways to take a data set and turn it into something useful. They may be right, they may be wrong, but it's their view and presumably that's why the people are giving them money to invest. So I think that's by far the most interesting development I've seen. Yeah, I think we see some developments from from technology point of view because alternative data and the numerous sources of alternative data and the usage that you want to have they're not scalable. So there is a lot of still work we discussed with the panel to download, to understand, to clean, to verify a hypothesis, to test the straight etc. So it requires a lot of effort, and especially if you deal with thousands of data sources with uh, with which you have must have separate legal agreements and so on. It becomes really a, a jungle that you have to manage. And I think for us to, to, to push the usage of alternative data to the next level, uh, we need some breakthroughs in, in that, that, that and, and I think it, it's coming. The second aspect is also uh, methodology. You know, everybody speaks about LLMs now and uh, chat GPT. Unless you don't put in your investment deck, you know, chat GPT, you don't raise money. We had troubles because we didn't want to put LLMs because 
in the end, if you're an investor, you care about predictions, so you care about time series. Okay, it's useful to have ChatGPT to summarize your documents, and that's absolutely fine. It's 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 really a lot of operational alpha, as they call it, savings. But when it comes to investment, you have to predict the time series, and language models are not made for that. And when it comes to this type of methodology, working with big data, uh, time series, you know, I think we'll see things coming. So now everybody's focused on on LLMs, and and. Time series are under the radar, but in the end, this is what we need as investors. We need to predict what will happen with some variables, you know, next month, two months, three months, uh, and so on. Time series all along. <laughs> you may. Thank you. Um, I'll take these two points that Evan and, and uh, Alice uh, expressed, and I'll combine them. Um, something may be a little bit controversial, but but from economic perspective, it, it makes total sense. Um, even if you don't find the data that you need, uh, the technology today uh, enables you to start collecting that data yourself um, r with a relatively low barrier to entry or find someone whom you will incentivize economically to collect the data for you, which means you're coming up with uh, additional sources of data um, that you define if you see enough economic value to, to test your hypothesis. I think this is uh, going to be, that's going back to customizable data sets and private data sets. Okay, so I'm the last one. I need to say something bold and smart. Uh, I, I think that especially, again, like in my industry, we are living right now like the renaissance of data. I mean, like we are in the same spot that edge funds were like 20 years ago. So statement number two is everyone will be like a data-driven investor in 10 years' time. There is no other way to do this job in 10 years that is not using alternative data in different source and degrees. Um, does that mean that everyone is going to be a programmer or coder? No, at all. So there are like more and more tools these days that are going to allow like these people that don't know how to code to use alternative data in a better way and get some value out of it. Um, I, I, I think that like the more interesting question that I'm going to leave open because I'm not sure that I have like an answer yet is how much of technical talents does really needs to reside in a fund in 10 years time to be even more competitive or is this like commodization of tools and GPT and LLM and you know whatever you want to put like in this big mix is that really going to like you know level up the uh, the field Thank you. So personally, I think that the most impactful trend um, that's been happening is the is the availability of talented people more so than technology that have the experience of working with um, the the budding field of alternative data uh, as it's maturing, and um, it's that sort of um, deep expertise. Um, that is becoming more prevalent across the industry that is really, you know, going to take this maturing sector to the next stage of its evolution. So with that, um, please give everybody a hand. And uh, that's it.